I would consider myself a digital kid because I like technology a lot and I know how to use it. In the 20th century, we taught our kids what to learn. We lined their desks up in rows and put the teacher at the front of the classroom. But in today's world, many educators are questioning the status quo by meeting young people where they are. They're using 21st century tools to help prepare kids for a 21st century world. Join us for a look at the front lines of this change. Major funding provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And by the Pearson Foundation, promoting literacy, learning, and great teaching in local communities around the world. More information at pearsonfoundation.org. Additional funding provided by Bring your passions to the world through the power of technology. I'm in. Cisco Networking Academy. You can learn more at mindwideopen.com. Adobe is proud to sponsor PBS and digital media, new learners of the 21st century. Today's students will need creativity and collaboration for success in the 21st century. Welcome to the new literacy. Probably the most important thing for kids growing up today is the love of embracing change. In a world of rapid change, the need to memorize something is a 20th century skill. The need to navigate in a buzz of confusion and to figure out how to trust the information that you find, if you can feel confident doing that, the world is yours. How can we leverage digital media in schools? We can stop being driven by fear. Um, we can start to understand that this is the world the kids live in and that our schools can reflect that. John Dewey said it best. He said, if we teach today's students the way we taught them yesterday, we rob them of tomorrow. And we are doing that all over this country. The literacy has always been defined by the technology, right? Before the printing press, your ability to orally recite something meant to be literate. And so as technology has made things cheaper, we're now saying, well, hmm, is someone literate if they cannot critique media, take media in, if they're only taking in traditional text? That's a question to answer today, but what would that mean in 2020? I would venture to say that they won't necessarily be considered as being literate. We find when we talk about 21st century skills, people often reduce them to skills for the workplace and skills involving technology. And we really are thinking about skills for creativity, for civic engagement, for social life, the full range of experiences that young people will be involved in in the future. If you look around you, young people everywhere, at home, in malls, and in schoolyards, are texting, tweeting, and gaming. They're joining virtual interest groups making and uploading videos to YouTube, and defining who they are to their friends through their Facebook pages. While many parents are anxious about the time their children spend on cell phones, on social networks, and playing online games, a growing number of researchers and educators are excited about the opportunities these digital media platforms bring to learning. A cell phone can be a distraction in the classroom, or it can be an instant connection to the vast resources of the internet. A digital life may have more virtual relationships than in-person ones, but it improves the opportunities to interact with experts and form groups to support the interests that young people care most about. To produce the new learners of the 21st century, educators and others will have to find the right balance between the perils of being always on and the necessity for young people to creatively use the gadgets and digital media tools of everyday life. For the next hour, we explore five stories that show how educators, inside and out of the classroom, are inviting young people to use the digital media tools they value most to direct their own learning and take a more active role in shaping their experience of the world. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Gallucci. I am the president of the MacArthur Foundation. 
I am very pleased to welcome you all here, and <clears throat> I thank you very much for coming. It's a wonderful and remarkable show of interest. This is, uh, for us, the latest in a series of public events uh, in Chicago that MacArthur is organizing uh, in order that we share various aspects of our grant making with the city. It is a particular honor uh, to greet Chicago's mayor-elect, Rahm Emanuel, who joins us this evening. Mr. Emanuel has taken time from an incredible and overwhelming schedule to be here with us, and we very much appreciate it. His presence signals both a commitment to the cause of education in our city and a determination to put Chicago schools at the forefront of innovation and achievement. We also welcome Karen Cantor, Director of the Office of Educational Technology in the U.S. Department of Education. Ms. Cantor has spent her career creating environments that nurture learning. She is now spearheading similar efforts at the national level. We appreciate her effort in coming to Chicago for this event, and we acknowledge the co continuing support and encouragement that the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, has given to MacArthur's work in digital media and learning. Some of that work is represented in the PBS feature, Digital Media, New Learners of the 21st Century, a portion of which you have just seen. We are grateful to PBS for doing a superb job of the documentary, and the additional materials you may access on their website. Along with MacArthur, the Pearson Foundation was a major funder of the film. We are pleased to have Mark Neeker, the Foundation's president, participating in this evening's discussions. MacArthur entered this field because we recognized that digital technology was bringing fundamental changes to how young people learn and interact. We funded both the first large-scale studies of what these changes were and some of the ways schools and other learning institutions changed in response. You will learn more about these from our panelists and demonstrations later this evening. Some of the early findings are encouraging. You will have heard worries about the distractions of multitasking, about information overload, about verifying internet, internet material, about polarizing online communities. These are real concerns. I share them. I am also convinced, though, that old liter literacies, being able to read well, write effectively, analyze, express opinion, and engage in debate are more necessary than ever. But we have found that in the new environment, young people can master these traditional competencies in new ways. Instead of simply consuming information, they are investigating it using digital resources. Instead of separating knowledge into academic disciplines, they are exploring the connected intellectual systems and social systems in which we live. And all this is happening in a highly participatory way with kids linked to others who share their interests in school hours and throughout the day and indeed the night. How this can be put to work in the classroom is seen at the Quest to Learn School in New York City, which MacArthur supports. The school encourages students to learn through games designed as intellectual challenges, to understand how systems function as networks of information and behaviors, and to link theory to practice not just by studying subject matter, but by actually being young biologists, mathematicians, or historians. It is an exciting place to be. Next fall, a similar school will open in Old Town called Chicago Quest. It will be a campus of the Chicago International Charter School. The first class of sixth and seventh graders will join one of the most innovative learning programs in America. In this project, MacArthur reaffirms its commitment to Chicago and to reimagining education for the digital age. We expect Chicago Quest graduates will be exceptionally well equipped to succeed in the 21st century. Information about the school is available here tonight and online. This event is being audio taped and will be broadcast on Chicago Public Radio's Chicago Amplified series 
It is also being videotaped for airing on CAN TV. We thank both of these organizations. Please, folks, stay after the program for the reception that follows and to see the demonstrations of digital media and learning projects. This part of the event is on the ninth floor of this building. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Chicago's mayor-elect, Mr. Rahm Emanuel. I thought so. Thank you, Bob. I'm glad everybody's here. Nice to see you. I just actually uh, came from my old congressional district uh, in the Foreman High School with Maggie Daly and our after school program and after school matters. And as you know, uh, in the campaign, I pledge that we will have a comprehensive program for every child in the city of Chicago's public school program. And we saw a dance initiative. We saw an athletic, artistic, athletic, and academic. Kids were also working on science. Most importantly, they were in a safe space doing something after school that raised their self-esteem. Chicago has led the way in the country with one of the most comprehensive after-school programs led by Maggie Daly, the ASM, After School Matters. I want Chicago to lead in digital learning. And I'm very excited by the school, and I want to thank both the foundations and others who are participating. So Chicago will lead in what I think is the most essential endeavor here, like after school and the initiative there. We have to adapt to how kids learn. And they have used digital media. I have a child that needs to turn on my Blackberry for me. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> I don't want you to get too scared about the mayor-elect. <laughs> Although the TiVo does flash just 12 in the house. Uh, but we have to use and we have to learn and adapt and not teach because it was done in a methodology of 1911 in 2011 we have to adapt to how kids learn. And the new school will put Chicago on the map as it relates to digital media. So to both the philanthropists as well as the private sector here in the room, I can't thank you enough as the next mayor. I look forward to more than just one school. I know that there's discussions about two other schools, and that to me is what Chicago's about. When it comes to different ways of learning, putting our kids first, making sure that we're teaching them in a way that they absorb the information and actually are interactive with it. We are taking a place in what I think is the most innovative and creative ways of education and instruction. So while one school is good, you have a commitment to work on what I think is important that we add a school on the west side and a school on the south side. So making, children, making sure children throughout the city have a potential to participate in the future. Now also, you're going to hear later from uh, Mary Dempsey, who's done a great job at our library system. And the libraries and Chicago library system is leading in the way and using, again, digital media as a way to do instruction and learning. So whether it's at home, school, library, that we have a comprehensive, seamless approach so our kids are learning in an interactive way in the way that they're supposed to or the way they are most comfortable in the 21st century. So to your commitment and both the foundation and others that are here, I want to thank you. I look forward to working with you and remembering first that our most important thing that we have to do, while we have a lot of challenges as a city, we have a lot of challenges as a country, that making sure that we improve the graduation rates of our children so they are ready to go to college or a career path fully capable of succeeding in their future years. Thank you for your commitment. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Dempsey, and I'm very privileged to serve as library commissioner for the Chicago Public Library. And um, I want to thank the mayor-elect for his gracious remarks because I am here this evening to talk about how digital learning has transformed the Chicago Public Library. For 138 years, the primary mission of the library has been to promote lifelong learning. And our trained professionals have made this possible through traditional methods, collections of books, free programs and lectures, 
access to free technology, and our rich resource collections. But digital media today allows lifelong learning at libraries to expand in ways that were simply inconceivable as recently as three years ago. Public libraries, those great third places beyond home and work or home and school where people connect and learn either formally or informally, public libraries are being transformed into new models of access and learning for youth and adults through the marriage of traditional resources and new media. So thanks to digital media and the coordinated work of librarians and mentors, the Chicago Public Library now finds itself at the forefront of an institutional shift for libraries and for other institutions of learning, a shift from being a place primarily for information consumption as an individual activity to a, a place that supports collaborative production and creation of information fostered through new media. Using the research of Dr. Mimi Ito at the University of California at Irvine and an innovative public-private partnership between the Chicago Public Library, the Digital Youth Network of DePaul University, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Pearson Foundation, Chicago's youth have found a new and innovative space to grow and learn in their out-of-school time. It's called UMedia. It's free. It's the first of its kind in the world and it lives and thrives at the Chicago Public Library. At U Media, teens hang out with friends in person and in social spaces like Facebook. They mess around using digital media to make videos, record music, play games, on I and critique games. They, they also uh, critique things on their own social learning network, and then they geek out by engaging in projects such as our One Book, One Chicago program, the Library of Games podcast and blog. They write for U Lit magazine, and they create original works for U Media Records. And of course, we haven't even touched on the surface, our Louder Than a Bomb spoken word poetry team won first place in the citywide competition. They went from last place to first place. Dr. Ito's research on which, the, on which the principles of U Media are based supports the uh, notion that 21st century teens learn by making and doing, and that they develop critical thinking skills through collaborative learning that combines a variety of resources, such as, as I said, technology, books, workshops, experiential learning, and mentors. Most importantly, the research found that when surrounded by these resources, Learning takes place anywhere and anytime. Significant learning made possible by new media takes place outside of the classroom in libraries, museums, and through the arts. And when this research was put into action at U Media almost two years ago, we all hoped for good results. But the results have been nothing short of extraordinary. Drop into U Media any day of the week, and you will see teens from more than 60 high schools, public, parochial, charter, private, working collaboratively on original works of poetry, music, film, digital images, the urban environment, art, or current events, or whatever interests them. They're guided by mentors and librarians and artists trained through the Digital Youth Network, and they are learning. They are really, really learning. They've become urban planners, artists, poets, bloggers, designers, and builders. They've tapped their creativity, they've fueled their intellectual curiosity, and they've become civically engaged. By their own admission, the U Media teens have learned to write and to read. They've learned to write critically, and they read quite a lot. Our book circulation to that population has risen dramatically just by the kids being in the same space with the books and the media. And what they read and what they interpret through digital media with prose and poetry is sometimes astonishing, very clear, very brutally honest, and quite beautiful. They also explore the public library in a way that surprises even them, and they use those resources to learn by creating original works. In U Media's physical space and through its social learning network, these teens have become so engaged and articulate about how to advance quality of life in their neighborhood and in their city. The Chicago Public Library has embraced UMedia because it spurs critical thinking by teens and supports the creation of a connected learning environment for youth. 
Libraries can and do serve as a hub on the network of learning by fostering and leveraging partnerships with schools, parks, museums, and community-based organizations through this marriage of traditional and new media. And we're very pleased at the Chicago Public Library that thanks to support from the MacArthur Foundation and the federal government, three new U-Media sites will open in branch libraries in June of this year. And that with the support of the MacArthur Foundation and the Institute for Museum and Library Services of the federal government, the U-Media model that was born at the Chicago Public Library will expand to 30 new locations across the country in the next three years. So spurred on by our rich history as one of the nation's premier public library systems and our recent experiences as an innovator for lifelong learning, the Chicago Public Library is committed to providing the widest access to possible to information through all of our collections, virtual and real, provided by our trained professionals in 76 locations across the city of Chicago. We embrace that role as a hub of lifelong learning as part of an ecosystem of youths and adults enabled with this new service delivery model and innovative resources and partnerships. In times of great economic stress, such as we are suffering now, people turn to their public library for the resources they need to live their lives, to engage in lifelong learning, to raise and educate their children. In times of economic stress, the free public library becomes a lifeline for every person in every corner of this city and an assurance that a higher quality of life is attainable through the resources of the public library. For 12 million visitors a year, the Chicago Public Library is a cultural institution, an educational resource, a source of entertainment, a financial savior, and it's a refuge. But U Media has opened exciting new vistas for us. At the library, we continue to challenge ourselves and we continue to be challenged by those who use us and rely on us to help shame, shape, to help shape the new face of change of the 21st century and thus to help shape the future of our great city. And now I would like to introduce another clip from the PBS documentary, Digital Media, New Learners in the 21st Century, which showcases the extraordinary work of our U Media partner, Dr. Nicole Pinkard of DePaul University and the Digital Youth Network. Kids nowadays, they 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 watch the movie, they they watch the music video, they they look at photos, you know, they look at graphic arts, you know. So what's what's to stop me from, you know, saying having a say in what what my generation sees or interprets or what they like? Film has just given me a voice like that I didn't know I had before. It just gave me a new way to express how I'm feeling and express my ideas because I was never a really good writer. And music, it's always been something that I wanted to do. I always wanted, like, you know, music lessons, like, Mom, can I get piano lessons over and over again? But I could never really get that. If I can't access the place where I like to practice my passion, then where do I go? That's pretty much a dream deferred. Digital Youth Network was started over five years ago, really out of trying to understand how we could support youth in learning to use digital media for all aspects of their life. We started out as just an after-school program, but we quickly uh, developed an in-school media arts program. We've also then in the last year established a partnership with the Chicago Public Library to open up a high school only space called UMedia, which is a space just for 9th to 12th graders. The thing that drew me in about DYN was a studio upstairs. spot for inspiration really and on top of the inspiration it's a spot where you have the tools as well. Yeah. 
I go in there and know that I want to shoot in this location, but I don't go in and say, okay, I know for a fact I want this angle, I know for a fact I want this angle. I just go out and have fun and, you know, I, I, I talk I talk to the people who I'm shooting. I mean, it's more like a, a hangout rather than an actual photo shoot. You know, it, it makes everything feel more comfortable and my photos always come out better that way. I look forward to the outcome of each picture, you know. As I'm showing people my portfolio, I like to see their reactions because that's something I like personally. If your learning is just about what you've learned now, I mean, how much did you master? It isn't all that useful because in five years from now, a lot of it will be out of date or tra transformed, or there'll be completely new things for you to learn. So in our world, in the 21st century, kids need to get a deep passion because learning requires a lot of practice. And it kind of doesn't matter what passion you get when you're a little kid because the passion becomes about how do you become a learner. He spent a lot of time working and learning to do video, but he also decided to move in a different direction, and he self-taught himself how to do photography and also how to do graphic design. I mean, he's definitely gotten some instruction from us, but he sort of came back to us with the skill set in graphic design, and when asked how you, how you learned to do it, he said, oh, I found all these videos on, on YouTube, and I've taught myself how to do it. And I think there's so many examples like him of a kid that if you put opportunities in front of him, he'll take advantage of them. But if he doesn't have those opportunities, he's going to find ways to, to spend his time that might not be the most advantageous for him. This, this does keep me out of trouble, you know what I mean? I don't really have to, you know, go out and kick it until 4 o'clock in the morning all the time, you know, just to have a story to tell the next day, you know what I mean? Sometimes I could just, you know, come home, sit, you know, look up, you know, different photographers, or I can do some, I can retouch some, some stuff myself. We did a project two years ago called Division 201, where uh, over a course of six weeks, we created a really nice 15 minute short on um, just diversity in the school and how segregated people actually are inside of the classroom. I'm Maritza. I'm Maritza. I'm guessing you're Maritza. I'm Mr. Cartman, and this is Division 201. People say, oh, you know, that digital media is killing reading and writing. Not true at all. It's changing the ecology of reading and writing. Different practices happen, different types of texts are produced, but by no means is it killing them. Kids are reading and writing more than they ever did, but they're just not doing the type of reading where you sit in your bedroom by yourself reading a novel. <laughs> Media work builds on top of traditional literacy. And if a kid hasn't had art, if they don't understand color, if they don't understand shapes and circles, then it's very hard for them to, to say, oh, we want to do graphic design. You can't write a movie unless you create a script first. Oftentimes, great songs have to be written down. Right? So the final product we're seeing is often the video format, but so many traditional forms of literacies go on. Over the course of being a part of DYN, I've had to do a lot of collaborating and I just had to learn how to, sometimes you have to take a, the passenger seat, not the back seat, but uh, sometimes you do have to take the passenger seat and just go along for the ride. Because with, with doing film and media, you always have to be open-minded in everything that, that you look at. You learn a lot about, about people, how to connect to them, how to reach them, how to help them, what to say, what not to say. Like it pretty much gives, it pretty much makes you this very well-rounded person you know, and being able to fit in, in every pocket of society. I think my involvement with DYN affects everything that I get accepted to because it looks so good on my application because it's so extensive and since I've been with them so long, it shows such a big commitment. That sucks. Uh-oh, you just did a don't. Don't? What's a don't? Don't gossip. I'm going to Oberlin College next year in Ohio. I'm going to major in uh, cinema studies, mathematics, and computer science. And after all of this, I plan on opening up my own film production company for my best friend. 
Well, many of us as researchers would like to connect the ability to do digital media with being more engaged citizens. And what we saw is that as kids got um, older, so as they got to you know the late part of seventh grade and eighth grade year, they started applying their skill set more so in the community. So initially, you see them only applying them in the after school program. Then you start seeing them taking them into their home and sharing it with their cousins, with their parents. And then you see at the, you see them start doing workshops. We have kids doing workshops in schools. Kids doing this work in their in their church. I'm close up. He's walking. And we're going to try to estimate him in that same position. The class I'm teaching is a video editing pod. It's with sixth and seventh graders. I think you did good. Like in the beginning, you actually showed Jalen instead of his popping up in the middle of the video. I started off as just a student, and now I actually have my own class, and I used to just be a part of the class. And I don't know any teenager or a senior in high school that has a class full of students where they get to teach and create their own curriculum. Teachers and schools are very well aware of the fact that a lot of learning happens outside of the classroom. We know that it's the kids who read books at home, with parents who are highly engaged in the learning, the kids who have interests that are supported in the home. These are also the kids who do well in school. We know that the learning outside of school matters tremendously for the learning in school. Every kid has an interest. Sometimes he doesn't know what it is, sometimes he can't articulate it, but every kid has an interest. In this day and age, the responsibility of libraries, museums, schools, after-school programs, the type of institutions we work with, is to help kids identify those interests and then progress through that interest, become more advanced. It's just the same job as a tennis coach, the same job as a football coach. It's the academic coach. We know that the learning outside of school matters tremendously for the learning in school. So a lot of what we're trying to say about kids in formal learning with new media is part of an already existing set of understandings that educators have of the importance of the home environment, for the peer environment, for the community, for learning that happens in schools. The question is, how can we be more active about linking those two together? And I think this is a tremendous challenge that a lot of these experimental efforts are dealing with. I think for teachers uh, and schools and classroom learning, there's still an incredibly important role to play, which is about giving kids access uh, across the board to a baseline set of standards, literacies, expectations about what they need to participate uh, in contemporary society, to be reflective, um, and to also take opportunity of the fact that you really have kids and adults in a shared space that's safe, that's sanctioned, uh, that gives kids an opportunity to reflect on things in their everyday life that's not just about them being immersed in it all the time. So I think that there are incredibly important functions for schools. What we're saying by valuing informal learning is not that we should abandon formal learning, but that we should get those working together in a much more coordinated way. Hi, I'm Karen Cater, and I'm uh, the Director of uh, Education Technology at the U.S. Department of Education, and I have a great job because I get to work with your Chicago's very own uh, Arnie Duncan. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. So um, congratulations on the success of this documentary. I understand there have been uh, several hundred thousand people who have already um, had access to it, and it does kind of draw you in. You know, it's, it's just very, very watchable, and uh, you know, you have your, uh, Shani's a, a rock star over here, and, and uh, some, just some, some great pieces to this, to this film. So congratulations, and a huge thank you to, um, to the MacArthur Foundation, uh, Connie, and to Pearson Foundation, um, Mark Niker, um, for funding the production, for, for working so closely with it, so for you know, maintaining the integrity of the story and to Twin Cities Public Broadcasting for um, actually producing this. It's, it's really an extraordinary piece, and I'll tell you, we are encouraging all sorts of people to watch it so they really get a sense of what's going on. 
So Secretary Duncan is also incredibly grateful for the hard work that you all are doing every single day to figure out better and better new ways of reaching young people with an effective education. So as you probably know, President Obama has set the goal of becoming the country with the highest proportion of college graduates in the world by 2020. Currently, about 40% of, of adults have a, some kind of a college degree, and this would require us to get to about 60% of our young adults with degrees by 2020. So we have some work to do. But unfortunately, an incredible number of students are leaving school every day and are left behind, as they say. A full 50%, and in some cases more, minority students drop out of high school. So we must have an all-hands-on-deck strategy to meet the needs of way more of this country's students. So all of the programs highlighted in this entire documentary are, 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 direct, are directed squarely at vastly improving the learning opportunity for the students that they serve. President Obama and Secretary Duncan recognize that transforming the, educa the education system in this country is not as much about competition, but rather this is, the purpose of this is to develop our economy, to engage our citizens in civics and discourse, the ability to analyze issues, think critically, to vote well, vote being informed. High quality education is also a matter of social justice. But what kind of education are we talking about? Jean Sperling, who is the, um, the uh, director of the National Economic Council at an Aspen Institute in January, likened the challenge of education today to training for the Olympics in 2020, only you don't know what sport you're training for. So the stories and ideas throughout this entire film are all about supporting a generation of students and becoming fit, fit learners, fit thinkers, so that they can be successful at whatever comes their way whatever they're doing in 2020. There was as much a focus throughout this film on who are you right now as who do you want to be. For example, the students at the Philadelphia Science and Leadership Academy are demonst demonstrated in the film engagement with complex thinking, design, creative endeavor, interesting projects, and challenging problems. The students in this Umedia program that you just saw demonstrated incredible literacy, storytelling, and world exploration through the production of media. All of the examples through the entire film incorporated intelligent and really helpful feedback assessments, not for accountability purposes, but rather to support the learning in real time. So these stories beautifully and articulately and successfully told the story of the opportunity that we have to much more fully engage students in compelling and interesting, indeed, much more powerful learning experiences. And technology is enabling these experiences. These experiences include social media, digital media, collaboration, interaction, participation, personalization, and they actually involve play. So let's consider where we are today with this, this whole world of digital literacy and digital media. So I'm sure you, as I was, or have been uh, transfixed by the events in the Middle East. And as they have unfolded, these, the, the role of Facebook and Twitter and Flickr, these social media sites, have, it's really been extraordinary. These sites have emerged as key players in this conflict. The social media sites have presented the opportunities to tell very personal stories and real stories coming from all sorts of corners. They connect people and groups and they coordinate, they help coordinate and mobilize protests. And in Japan, amazing, thousands of videos shot on the spot with mobile phones, devices that people had in their pockets, took it out, we could see the earth shake, see things move. And, and these, these stories emerged and, and they bring us into the tragedy as it unfolds and in the ensuing days and weeks. So access to digital media and full participation with digital media is changing our lives. On a lighter note, when the video first launched in February and, and we, we, uh, we had a discussion about it, we had all just watched the Super Bowl full of commercials that were touted as demonstrating the tipping point between old and new media. For example, the advertising strategy for the, for the feature length movie Rio required you to slow down the advertisement and freeze the frames until you could find the hidden code 
that would unlock a new level of Angry Birds. And then this entered you into sweepstakes for a trip to the film premiere in Rio de Janeiro. So they figured out how to turn their 30 seconds that they paid for into a much longer slot of time. Doritos once again, again premiered their homemade advertisements. And the guy who won this year, he produced the winning advertisement. He was a 31-year-old part-time designer of websites for students, for kids. And he spent about $500 filming the spot that won and was aired on the Super Bowl. The VW commercial, you love the, the kid that starts the, the VW um, um, using the force. VW premiered their advertisement for days prior to the game so that by game day, they'd already had 13 million views. So what used to be a $3 million, 30 second production now actually is a very complex strategy with all of the lead up and the participation and the follow up as important as that 30 second spot. Those are the keys to success. USA Today actually called the Super Bowl this year a multi-channel, multi-platform, deeply social experience. And they measured the exponential participation on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So from overthrown governments, to the tragedy and loss and survival stories of earthquakes and tsunamis, to the way we socialize and connect, to the way we market goods and services, the world has become ever more interconnected and social, leveraging the power of digital media. So now, we have an incredible opportunity to transform learning into a deeply social experience, one that can leverage mobile, techno mobile technologies, social networking, digital content, we can leverage the long tail of interest and design education environments that include prior experience, outside of school experiences, multiple languages, families, the community, all the places that students live and breathe. We can make sure that students have one life, not two, in school, out of school. We can do this by connecting the informal and formal learning environments. We support One Life Not Two by encouraging broad participation in all manner of programs outside of, outside of school, and then acknowledging the work and play outside of school as viable learning by giving it credence and hopefully, in some, way, in some cases, full credit inside of school. President Obama in his State of the Union address said that we need to out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build other countries. So to that end, we at the Department of Education are focused on managing the transition from a predominantly print-based classroom to a digital learning environment, one with all the affordances that digital brings us. This transition is no less significant than the integration of the printing press into society more than 500 years ago. The printing press did, and now this new digital learning environment will, improve the opportunity for many more students to learn and to achieve at higher levels. This documentary, Digital Media, New Learners of the 21st Century, tells the five stories, each of them bringing the potential of powerful learning to life so that many more people, and I understand this film has actually kind of gone viral at this point, so that many more people can watch these stories and they can say, I get it, I get it. We can create these environments for our students as well. All of our students, all of our children deserve these kinds of powerful experiences. We must figure out how to scale up these examples and make this happen for many more students. Telling these stories is really an important part of a compelling strategy. So again, thank you for the amazing contribution of this film and the work that you all do every day to improve the opportunity to learn. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the next video clip. Yesterday I had the pleasure of sharing the stage with Katie Salen, who is engaged in designing learning environments that leverage the role of digital media and more specifically game design and, and game thinking and systems thinking. And just as the Chicago U Media engages students in production, not just consumption of media, Quest to Learn in New York City engages students in game design and systems thinking, not just playing games, although we also know that students playing games create an incredible opportunity to learn as well. So the next clip, the next clip showcases Katie's extraordinary work and the work of reimagining re learning. And in fact, 
the implementation of this reimagined learning design at Quest to Learn in New York City. And I'm thrilled to find out that the um, lucky city of Chicago will be opening their very own versions of these Quest to Learn schools sometime in the future. And with that, I think we can roll the next clip. Thank you very much. We like games that are challenging. As game designers, we have to really understand the player is the most important part of your game. The player is the one that tells you whether your game is good or not. Now, you're, you're designing your games for a very critical audience, which is your peers. Uh, my name is Jaden. My name is Case. Nadine. Nicholas Rodaliari, if you want my full name. And I go to uh, Quest to Learn. Quest to Learn is a school for digital kids. Like a lot of people must say as a slogan, the school of the future. It's mainly what we do here. We learn, we read, um, but we also do a lot of digital things. We use a lot more technology at the school. Um, we do a lot of hands-on projects. We don't sit in front of textbooks. We learn through gaming and like playing games. The teacher also does talk, tell us things. It's like we just watch a computer all day like this. It's not like that completely. It's not all like that. It's a system-based thinking, trial and error, lots of stuff that's really fun and unlike other schools. We have the basic classes of a school, but we gave them different names, like math is called code worlds, science is the way things work, social studies is BSP for being space and place, and sports for the mind, it's more like designing things for that class. Rocco, you want to guide me through your game? Okay. I want you to, I want to see your diagram first. I took out a couple of things because okay. it would have been too cluttered. Okay, so at first you're presented with three choices. Okay. Two of which are wrong. So one actually leads to a goal. Okay. I used to think that when I was a little kid that if you put two video games together and one one system, they would combine the games, so I always thought it'd be really fun to make a game. Game design is not just like we click on a button and we have a full game. Game design is all about trial and error and figuring out all these things that would make a good game. The more choices you have in a game, what happens? Um, you play it more times. You know? play it more times, exactly. And it is what? Because if you like, only have one choice, you're only going to play it once, and then you're going to say, oh, I don't want to do it again. And exactly. Play. Generally, when we work with kids around making games, it's not just you sort of set them loose in a game-making program. Um, there tends to be a very structured way in which you uh, pose a set of guiding questions, like, are you engaging the player? Are you giving the player feedback? Do they know where to go now? Um, and all of that, those are um, big systems concepts. They design something part way and then you stop them and you do it a kind of assessment which may involve them drawing diagrams. Oh, so basically you, you, this is the end, the yeah. goal. Okay, so we have two different endings. Do we have any dead ends in here? Um, I have not put them. Okay, so this is like a next step for you to work, to put a couple of dead ends in there. I think the construct that has been most overlooked now uh, in the 21st century, uh, maybe in the 20th century as well, is the power and importance of play. Very often when you're tinkering, it doesn't make pure logic sense. It's something you begin to feel in your hands as much as your mind. Tinkering brings thought and action together in some very powerful, magical ways. Where you say, oh! And things just suddenly gel. They just come together. And it's like, like an epiphany. Well, that epiphany that happens through playing and then seeing something just come together um, never leaves you. That is a lifelong learning event. Right now we're working with Little Big Planet, the PS3 game. And we're make, signing stuff for Fables, um, Aesop's Fables. And we have to create a level by using their Create Level template. 
which is really cool. So we get to make characters and sets and stuff. There are a point to that. They get to work on a kind of translation project. So they're studying a story and they're looking at what does it take to translate the components of a story into a live 3D game environment. So it's a little bit like a virtual theater performance of a story that has come from a kind of oral tradition of storytelling, moved to a printed page, moved to a kind of graphic novel format, now into a 3D game environment. Doing game design in school teaches you to, to attack a complex problem into smaller pieces. It also makes you think on many different levels at once. By designing games, you see things in a new way. Oh, that's kind of nice with the change in background at the end. Our old model of schooling, you know, let's just teach you what you're going to know for the rest of your life, clearly isn't going to work. And it clearly isn't going to work to have a population who can't actually solve problems with their knowledge. So how do we get people prepared to learn in the future for things that don't even exist now, and how do we prepare them to be able to innovate and solve problems and not just know a bunch of facts they can't use? And Quest to Learn is one paradigm of how to do that, and a very thoughtful one because it's based on an analogy uh, to games, to how people learn in games. Now, why should it be based on an analogy? A game is nothing but a problem space. What is a video game? It's just a set of problems. It could be anything. Civilization is problems in history. Halo's problems in a fantasy world of fighting. Uh, uh, Harvest Moon is problems in farming. Chibi Robot is problems in how to, a four-inch robot could clean a house. It doesn't matter what the problems are. All a video game is is a set of problems that you must solve in order to win. We have a wireless building, uh, the kids use laptops. Um, and with the reason we do that is so that we can put them away when it's actually not the best tool for them to be learning with. But all of the classes use all different kinds of digital media. We've had kids do uh, make digital comics as part of their curriculum. They've been working uh, in a unit on ancient civilizations, a series of whole collectible cards that were in PDF form that they uh, did research on and created the cards and then printed them out and had sort of collectible decks like Pokemon. Um, kids produce video podcasts, they use flip cams. Um, but for us, digital is just a choice of one tool among other kinds of tools. Um, but it it is something for many kids that actually really helps them. I'm a daydreamer. I have to try to pay attention. But sometimes we see cool things, we have some cool assignments, sometimes we get movies. Like I know in a lot of schools like they have like maybe once in a while we get a movie. But this happens much more often. We get videos from the internet, so it happens more often. And since I like to watch TV sometimes or go on the computer, so that kind of, I guess, maybe helps me a little. Well, it's more entertaining and it kind of gets you engaged. And it's like, it's not like, oh, I have to learn this. It's like, oh, this looks fun. I want to learn it. Well, when we play games, it has to do with what we're learning. Like, there's a website called uh, academicskillbuilders.com, and there's, there's a bunch of math games that have to do with division, multiplication, etc. And we, she lets us play it a lot, and but we're learning from it. Well, it motivates me because I try to like I try to win, but while I'm trying, like while I'm like practicing, like all the games have to do with learning, so I have to like study to like win. So it's kind of like stealth learning. The kids are learning, but they're having fun learning it. So they 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 don't know they're learning, but we do assess them quite rigorously at every stage of the process. We have a standards-based curriculum. We follow the New York State standards to the letter, and that's our kind of baseline. However, we do have these other competencies that we believe are important, which include a lot of the technology stuff. And then there's also social-emotional learning competencies, which include a lot of the collaboration stuff. Now, their storyboard, who did the storyboard, maybe? We all did the drawings. We all did the drawings. That's what I like to see. And who is the set designer? I have to say, great work, great work, teamwork, and nice results. So now we're going to move on to team number four. If a learning system is well designed, 
you don't finish it without the guarantee you learned it already. Now that's true of a good game. A good game, if you finish it, you're, you learned how to play it. It's designed in such a way that you don't get to the next level unless you're prepared to learn on that level. So you can see that we could imagine a day where learning and assessment are the same thing. That is, we build such rich learning systems, they already assess themselves. Think about it, that would be, in the end, cheap because we wouldn't need the testing industry anymore. We, we would just need a learning industry. A lot of concerns that parents have when we start talking about games is a concern around competition. Um, and what they get worried about is, oh, there's this game stuff where kids get addicted and all they want to do is get better, 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 better. And so we've tried to strike a balance with that um, to say that, well, what's really awesome about that is that kids are driven to get better. Well, addiction, we've got to be careful how we use the word addiction because it really is a term that's used to police our culture. So a kid who stays up late reading a book is rewarded and recognized as having had a dedication. A kid who stays up late trying to beat a video game is called addicted. A kid who spends months getting ready for a school play or a football game is seen as having shown real dedication and accomplishment. A kid who spends that same time working with his guild in World of Warcraft is thought to have a problem. So I think there's a double standard here, and we're using this term addiction to refer to things we don't value, but that may in fact be deeply valuable for students and young people in their lives. Now there are certainly experts who say that there's a limited number of people who may well be addicted to games or the internet, but relatively few. And in most cases, what we're reading as symptoms of addiction are signs of depression that we should pay attention to. You know, a kid who's depressed doesn't necessarily have a lot of emotional energy, doesn't want to get out in the world, may seem socially isolated. But we're mistaking cause for symptom when we blame the internet or the computer game on that kind of behavior. I'm Connie Yao from the MacArthur Foundation. Hey, I'm uh, Mark Neiger from the Pearson Foundation, and we're the panel. <laughs> <laughs> And we're joined by three terrific folks who have already been introduced through the film. How's everybody doing? <laughs> have you enjoyed the film clips so far? Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> Mark and I have had the tremendous pleasure uh, of working together over the last three or four years, as well as having the pleasure of having uh, funded the film. And part of uh, the reason for our wanting to fund the film was twofold, really. Part of it is that as we've been uh, extraordinarily privileged to support some extraordinary work uh, over the last couple of years that it, with folks such as the folks on our panel tonight that have really dug in deep to begin to do the hard work of reimagining what learning should look like in the 21st century. We also noticed that there were a fair amount of films coming out Waiting for Superman, The Lottery, Race to Nowhere, that we're really sort of taking a negative view of what's happening in learning and education today. And we really thought that there's some extraordinary, there's just some extraordinary work going on that should be highlighted by folks who are really trying to push forward, be innovative, and really think about what we should be doing for kids and with kids for the 21st century. And we wanted to highlight that. And the film has been picked up um, thanks to the work of Daniel Gummett, who's here tonight, and the folks in Minneapolis um, in over 100 cities across the United States. It's already been seen by over 700,000 folks. It's going to be aired in Chicago on WTTW, I think, on April 4th and 5th. So I hope folks will watch the, the entire film and get a chance to see all the, the, the three, there are three other episodes in the film and also go to the PBS website. So but the, for the remainder of the evening, we're really hoping to engage you all in a conversation. Mark and I wanted to kick it off with a couple questions for our panelists. And then um, also, uh, after we're done with the conversation, there are demonst demos, demonstrations up on the ninth floor, which we'll tell you about. But you saw some great work both at Quest to Learn and at UMedia. And the folks who have been doing that work are actually going to be up on the ninth floor and, and want to take you through and show you some of that work. So we'll hope you'll stay after the conversation and join us for the reception and the demonstrations up on the ninth floor. But where I want to start, and I'll start, Katie, with you, but, but I'm hoping that everybody on the panel will, will respond to the question, is that the thing that really comes out for me and, and strikes me in, in both of the clips is how incredibly engaged the kids are um, and really seem to be loving what they're doing. 
And you're a designer, you're a game designer, and I wonder if you could start us off just by telling us a little bit about how you think about designing experiences for kids, because it's clearly very different than what we've seen anyplace else and in any other school. Sure. So one thing that game designers think about first and foremost is what is the interesting complex problem that you're going to drop your player into? Um, and we talk about that as creating a need to know in the player. And so when we started thinking about the design of curriculum at, at Quest to Learn, the first thing we had to ask um, of our teachers was what is the need to know that you're going to create in that child for them to want to learn how to do fractions, to want to learn, for example, um, the sort of American history and the kind of rise of the 13 colonies. Um, without that need to know, kids tend to be not so interested in wanting to learn it. And so the, the way we think about the curriculum design at Quest to Learn is that we, we start with that need to know. So in the case of a social studies class that we have, uh, the seventh grade teacher said, well, you know, normally we need to teach American history. They have to learn about the 13 colonies. It's kind of really boring. They have to learn all these facts. Um, and so we asked her, well, what would be an interesting way to frame a problem that was happening around that time? And she said, well, gosh, could we think about the notion of point of view? and how it is that a range of participants or stakeholders in the kind of rise of the 13 colonies from the um, African-American slaves to Native Americans to British colonists, that they could experience the same things but come away with very different stories and very different points of view. And she felt like that was an interesting problem that kids would get interested in and wrap their heads around. And so we, we set up a, a unit that dropped kids into this, we called a mission, a 10 week long kind of complex problem space that on the first day they had no ability to solve. And so the way that it was framed is that there were a set of seven ghosts that were locked in the basement of the Natural History Museum, each representing one of those different stakeholders. And they'd been fighting for hundreds of years because they couldn't agree on a single story about what happened. And so the kids' job was to work for 10 weeks to help surface for them uh, um, all of the complexity around notions of point of view and why is it that a slave might experience a story in a very different way than a British colonist. And as part of that work, they had to uh, kind of do challenges around writing persuasive essays. They interacted with these ghosts in various ways, sometimes through digital media, sometimes through kind of primary documents. Um, and the kids were incredibly engaged. They aligned themselves with the different ghosts. Um, some of them went back to their family histories. Um, and by the end, they not only understood what had happened during the, the sort of rise of the 13 colonies, but they, they understood a lot about this notion of point of view um, and what does it mean to listen to others and step into other shoes? Nicole? Say a little bit both about the Digital Youth Network and how you thought, uh, think about designing experiences for kids in the out-of-school space, but then also what it then meant to begin to design for libraries. Because I know when I was a kid, I went in to grab a book and went into this funny smelling place, grabbed a book, and then left. So tell me a little bit about so what first, that's been like. First I can say we, we think we're on the right path with UMedia when we had a parent come down and say that they wanted to come in and see this place called UMedia because their student, their child was telling them that they were going to the library every day after school. <laughs> and and they, they didn't believe that that was true. So when we heard that, we knew we were, uh, we were, we were doing well. But the... Um, it's, it's wonderful for us to be working in the library because our work uh, with DYN started over six years ago and was really around this notion of what does it mean to be literate. And we knew that definitions of literacy was changing, and particularly since we were working with students on the south side of Chicago, we knew that schools had to play a role in this. But we had to figure out the relationship between school and out of school, and that if kids were going to buy into being literate and not just say, let me do this just because you know someone's telling me to do it, it had to be meaningful both at home, had to be meaningful with their friends. And so we created a way to do after school and in school. So students were learning how to develop their digital literacies around pop culture in the after school. And then teachers seeing students such as Shawnee and Malcolm, who's in the uh, audience, develop these skill sets, said, hey, I think I can bring this into my classroom. And so it's like what Mary and others have said. We created the space where learning in the outer school became relevant for the in school. And from the student standpoint, they're spending 24-7 trying to develop artifacts or products, digital artifacts, that give them, in some sense, some type of credibility with their friends that also helps them develop their literacies. So the library is the perfect place for us because what we also discovered is that when students left middle school, for us, and if in Chicago you go to all different types of high schools, we sort of had built this great capacity and then they were dispersed. 
So the library is that one space where anyone can come in, regardless of socioeconomic status, where they go to school. And it's a melting pot where kids from all over the city of Chicago come together. And it challenges us to make sure that what we're doing is relevant. Because a kid in an after school program, you know, if it's at your school, they probably have to stay there. But in the library, they can get up and walk out if they choose to. So we have to make it fun and relevant. And so that's been the most exciting part of the work so far. Mm -hmm. Shawnee, I've known you since you were in sixth grade. Very proud of you. Say a little bit about Digital Youth Network. A little bit, perhaps, what it's meant to you and how it's sort of put you on your path, perhaps? Um, well, uh, actually for me, it started in fifth grade when Dr. Pinker picked up, I think it was me and four other girls, um, and we started with Stage Cash Creator, which was a game, di game design program. And um, I wasn't really that into it at first. Uh, I didn't really get into it until uh, we were, it was brought into my actual grammar school and it introduced me to film and um, it just really, really gave me a new like learning way and just a new strategy to like, you know, get engaged into all of what I'm doing in my work in school because what it taught me was that there are different types of intelligences and you can't just judge somebody based off their book smarts because personally I don't think that I was the best writer. but. Uh, DYN brought it to the program. It all started with my science fair project in I think sixth or seventh grade. And um, my project involved using a propane torch. And of course, they wouldn't let me bring a propane torch to the display. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I filmed it and I created a video off of it. And the judges were blown away. I made it all the way to, I think, what was it, regionals or something. And um, everybody was just really, really impressed with my work. And from there, I did my living museum project on film. and. You know, they still use that in the example as the school of one of their best projects, and it just really, really gave me a new voice. And I think that's what, you know, DYN has done me. It's just shown me this new voice that I have or a new way to express myself that I didn't know before I was, you know, engaged with film or learned about it. And it, it really just, I don't know, it just, it, it gave me a way to, like, express myself, but also, like, become engaged with so many other different types of learning because, I mean, you use media and everything. Well, I know I do now. I'm in a Spanish class and I use Skype to talk to people who are in Spain so that I can learn my Spanish better because personally I'm really bad at it right now. It's my first semester. But I used all different types. They have games. We have a, a lab upstairs and it's just, it's really like, Anytime that I'm struggling with something, the first thing I do is, okay, I know I love media. What's the first thing that I can do to, you know, help me, you know, do better with it? And right now, Skype is doing really good. I talk to people in um, Barcelona or uh, <laughs> and, um, and all types of places. And everybody's just really helpful. And it's just really, really opened up a new pathway for me. Can I ask you a question about that? I mean, you're talking to people in Barcelona. So what are you expecting now of your teachers? How do you... How do you think of your teachers, and how do they think of you? Um, she, she, I mean, she kind of introduced me to the program, but uh, uh, she was really impressed when I went on it in the first place because um, a lot of the kids in my class, since it, it's a 100-level class, but a lot of people um, have already had a lot of experience with Spanish, so they were like, snap through it, and I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what this means. <laughs> but, um, and so we have to do an extra 24 hours outside of class as well as in class. It's a five credit class. It's every day, which is a lot of work. Uh, but um, um, so, and I think I'm the only person in the class who actually took up like, oh, Skype, okay. Let me get my hours off of that. And I talk to people. I type to them. I don't video chat them yet because I think that's a little weird. I haven't met you, but we do. <laughs> um, um, but we do type and we audio chat. And um, she, when I first showed her my card, and I was like, yeah, I spent two hours talking to Alberto, and he's from. <laughs> um, and where was he from? Uh -huh. I can't remember. He's from somewhere. But I could, it's a lot of people on my list now because they're all inviting me because you make this profile on Mixer. And um, she was like, oh, wow. You talk to somebody? I was like, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, she, so you really do use these media things. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's my niche. <laughs> so. Well, uh, I'm Alberto. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nicole, surprise. Nicole, can you talk a little bit about um, one of the, the key features of the Digital Youth Network is this idea of bringing kids along and having them be mentors. Can you, t can you talk a bit about that and also kind of what it means for a, for a, a young person to go from being a, a student to a mentor? So 
I'm going to use my uh, basketball analogy one time, one more time. I use basketball a lot in that um, when you're learning a sport, a sport, oftentimes you're, you know where you are, but you always have, you can always tell, look at someone who's above you and look at their skill set and use them to gauge where you need to be. And then you always have the professionals. And so we thought in the digital space, particularly with African Americans, there weren't those role models and those rep uh, representations. So we needed to bring in media artists who were practicing this and put them up as role models, but then also develop from the ground up students such as Shani and Malcolm and others, and Marcus who's here in the space, to have them become the role models, such that a sixth grader, instead of just looking up you know, to uh, George Lucas, can look up to an eighth grader and a ninth grader and see all the video work that Shani has done and say, well, I can aspire to that, which would then in, in, um, engage them in wanting to work harder. And an example of this is when Shani and them was graduating for the ninth grade, um, graduating from eighth grade, going to ninth grade, uh, a group of students decided, you know, Shani did get all these special privileges of going to videotape across the school, decided that they were going to host their own competition to see who could be the next Shani and Terrence and Malcolm. <laughs> and so what they chose to do was decide to videotape their graduation and sell it, sell all these CDs to people. But that was their way of creating their own audition. And so I think the challenge for us is to figure out how do you create, uh, and it's borrowing from games. Games are great because you think you can succeed. And you don't take on easy challenges in games. You want games that are going to challenge you, but you think you know how to make that next logical step, which keeps you in your seat. So we wanted to create in the digital space the same thing. Put, obstacle, put obstacles and milestones and people in front of them that any kid can say, I can do that. I know I can do that. So now let me sit in the seat, do the work, and get to that next level. I know that, Kate, that's very much the orientation of the Quest schools. But how did you find teachers who were able to do that? And could you talk a little bit also about what it means for parents to drop their kids in that space and how it changes the relationship between the parents and the school. Sure. When we first started talking about the school, we, uh, people looked at us in very skeptical ways and said, you'll never find teachers that can teach in this model. And what we said is, actually, we think there are thousands of teachers that can teach in this model. Uh, and we, you know, we looked for teachers that were passionate about learning. They were very curious um, and engaged in trying to understand how to uh, design experiences for their students that gave them a chance to be creative as well as, uh, they as teachers a chance to be creative as well as their students. They were teachers that uh, cared about innovation and had had some experience in their lives of operating within a space that was willing to try to kind of work in and around rules. They were teachers that were deeply collaborative and they understood that the collaboration was not just with their peer teachers but also with their students and with their parent community, that it was a whole learning community that needed to come together um, to look at how could you begin to create experiences for kids that not only help them learn, but also help them grow, you know, grow as human beings. And so Quest to Learn is a public school. We pulled from public school teachers in New York, um, and we had found a, a remarkable group um, that's been willing to work together and work really hard, um, ask tough, tough questions of themselves, really put themselves on the line um, around trying to reimagine what their classrooms can look like, and, uh, and it's been amazing. I'm actually eager to turn to the audience to hear some of the things that you've been thinking about and the questions that you might have. So I'm just going to ask one more question up here, but I hope you guys are thinking about questions that you might have for, for our panelists. Um, the obvious question that most folks in education want to know about is always about assessment. So I'm wondering, Nicole, I know that you um, have some interesting approaches in terms of the social network, the rubrics and the virtual economy that you've been working on. Katie, I know that it's a constant question for your school. And, and Shani, I'm just really curious, as a, someone who's been in DYN, once, um, Nicole, if you can tell us a little bit about the social network, I'd love to hear sort of, okay. sort of how you felt about that and how it compared a little bit to school for you. Okay. So we use a social, a closed social network. Think um, Facebook, Ning, but very educational. And what we decided to do, instead of just youth publishing. Wait. So it's called iRemix. <laughs> remix, remix learning, iRemix.com. And there's going to be a demo upstairs so you can go up and see it. Okay, okay. So thank you. Yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, when you go and review a book on Amazon, you like it, you just do, you know, thumbs up, five stars. We decided that we needed to do more than that. If students put up work, that it needs to be a space where they can get critique and also they can develop a language around what counts. And so we developed a whole rubric system. So instead of just judging a video saying it's a five star, you judge it on the quality of the image, the content, the, the, the all kinds of, what are the, some of the other things? Image content, 
the um, clarity. Clarity. See, she knows the language. That was a test. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we see is when kids get real feedback from, uh, from peers and also from mentors, they go through and do multiple iterations of the work. And so for us, it was to figure out how to do not just uh, formative, but also summative evaluation. So you can see one piece of work, or a student's work develop over from sixth grade up to 12th grade, they have a portfolio of all the work that they've, that they've put into the system. And so a piece of work might be a documentary that you're working on, uh -huh. for example. And so say a little bit about how you'd experience that, Shawnee. Um, well, I've experienced it on both sides of the fences now since uh, I was first a student and then I became a junior mentor. But um, it started off with me as just, um, Anytime I would create anything for school, because I, I used media a lot throughout high school and grammar school, as they always gave us an option since um, it was kind of incorporated into the school. And we had the one-on-one -on -one laptop program that they gave us an option of a lot of final projects. You could do a video or something. So anytime I would you know, create a documentary or something for class or a music video, say, for like uh, the last one I remember was a music video for my, uh, uh, what was it? Mm -mm, my English class. Um, it was my AP Lit uh, last year, and we read a bunch of short stories, and we got to pick a short story and create a music video of, of it. And I did the yellow wallpaper, and I used Lauren Hill's song "I Get Out," and she was just talking about how she feels like she was trapped in the yellow wallpaper. She was trapped, you know. And so I created a music video off of it, and so I will post that onto iRemix and get a lot of people's comments and feedback on it, and everybody's like usually really. Uh, impressed and they're just they're really supportive of your work and it's that's really great because you you post your work up there and it's really nice to post it on a place where there are other people who are into media as well so that they can critique your work and have a critical eye and actually know what they're talking about because it's one thing to just you know post it on like Facebook and people are like oh that's really nice but this other people are like they actually can you know give me um, structured criticism and they're like yeah, this is nice, but I think if you did this, it'll you know show this and that, and just little things that the natural person who's not really uh, technologically literate as much as the rest of us would you know pick out. And also from the other side of the fence, I've been able to, um, uh, I, as you saw, I had my own class last uh, last year when I was in high school, and um, uh, my sixth and seventh graders they um, well, they start out knowing nothing, but Afterwards, I would make them do re-edits of the movies that we would create, and they would post them and get you know critiques. And then I would, of course, have them like, all right. And we would also show it in front of the whole class, and then they, you know, go and put it up there, and they they see what they did wrong, or they see what they could make better based off of what everyone else was doing. And that was a way that they didn't just have to watch it in class; they can go online and look at everybody else's videos, and they'd also be able to be like, and at the end of it, it, the best part was just like, everybody was, oh man, look at my second one. This is great, Shawnee, Miss Shawnee. I, I think this is much better. And I'm like, yeah, the encouragement. And it's really hard to get them engaged at first because they don't, it's something new and it might be a little foreign to them. But once they're really into it and seeing what they're doing and how they're correcting and you know, just having fun with it, then that's when they really get into it. And that's where the social network comes in hand because it just allows you to be able to do that and not just inside of the school room or the classroom, but to actually go home and be like, yeah, I'm going to be on here and let me watch a bunch of people's videos rather than waste a lot of time on MySpace or Facebook. I'm not saying that it's all a waste of time, but I waste a lot of time on MySpace and Facebook. So, um, but it's just a new way for them to interact with people who have the similar interest. How do you think about assessment at Quest well, I was just gonna I was going to build on this. So some of the things that I hear in the stories that you guys are just telling is that the we can make assessment much more transparent to students now than we maybe could before. So in the social network, the rubrics are right up front. So when you go to look at a video and you, you're rolling over the stars to say, I think this is three stars in, in writing, there's actually a text there that says, well, this is what three stars in editing should actually look like. Um, and it used to be that assessment was a very hidden space from students. They didn't really have a voice in it. Um, but with these new kind of tools, and games are also very good at this, they make the data around performance present at every moment. It's given um, into the hands of the, the students, not just the sort of teacher. Um, and what that leads to is this process where you're very interested in refining and iterating and trying again and, and working for improvement. And as another student in the class, you feel like you can have a voice in helping other people get better. And it's a, just a radically different way of thinking about assessment and one that's incredibly productive for learning. 
um, because students don't feel like there's this sort of hidden knowledge that only the teacher knows what an A is, and that they're going to kind of like try on this test and then, you know, they wait a day and they get their test back and then they figure out how they did. Um, and that's so, part of that is that me digital media allows that. The social media spaces that tend to be rooted in communities um, provide that opportunity for everyone as part of the community to contribute in that way. Um, and I think it's going to have a big impact on the way we think about assessment ongoing. We'd like to open it up. Sure. The questions. I was going to say, I wish I could go back to school. I do have a question as someone who loves to write and loves the spoken word and good grammar and clear and concise language. Is there any way in these programs to incorporate attention to that because I go on Facebook and my younger relatives don't have those skills. And I'm wondering how you incorporate them. Well, we definitely do. Um, I think I said in the video, oftentimes the final product you might look at is a video, it's a song. But the work that goes into it is traditional literacy. Our uh, spoken word team at Umedia just won the Louder Than the Bomb uh, a poetry competition and it's going to the national. But if you go online in the social network, you see tons and tons of iterations on the poems that they're working on. And the comments and critiques that they're giving to each other isn't about the, uh, the verbal performance. It's about the written word and how it's written and even how they're using grammar and punctuation to accent and to show how they're going to speak. So I think oftentimes, while you might experience things in a media format, often you have to have a, a control um, and, a, and, a, and a great literacy of the traditional forms of literacy to end up making high quality, uh, enjoyable pieces of media. Why don't we do both two questions over there? Or I don't know where the mics are, just to make it efficient. Hi, good to see you again. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> just got back from Silicon Valley. Here's the observation um, NASA is doing open source, they're trying to figure out how to get back to their roots. HP had a conference out there. It seems like everything's going toward an informal mode of team know-how that doesn't get in the way. It doesn't break the momentum and is actually very natural and hugely relevant. It doesn't make people self-conscious. So if you boil that down, that's learning how to make choices in real time. And I was wondering, and for me as a media kid, I got some of this early a few years ago when I was a teenager, I was wondering whether you've had any feedback on the aspects of learning how to maximize your observation of choices and then make those as an indi individual and as a team in real time. It's live performance, it's games, it's sports, it's music. Just wondering. Well, I can talk about that a little bit. So one of the um, big things we care about it at at Quest to Learn and in, in our learning model is that we want kids to learn how to collaborate and work in teams. But it's not the type of collaboration that we often see where it's a, everyone's in a team together and they're all kind of expected to hold the same expertise and they kind of struggle because they don't know how to go forward if everyone is supposed to know the same thing. Um, and we're looking at a model of expertise that is very present in the workforce today. And, um, the notion of sometimes it's called working cross-functional teams. And it's the idea of people with from very different disciplines. So we are actually a group represents that pretty well up here. Um, each of us is charged with having expertise in our particular area. So we're deep specialists. But we're also able to come together a group, come together as a group, know how to communicate, and know how to work on a problem together. And so in the school, when we put kids into teams, they're often given very particular identities and, and types of expertise to take on. And Shawnee talked about this in the film a little bit around the, the film team that she's working on. There's probably a producer, a writer, someone who's um, an actor. And, and that's actually an incredible opportunity for kids as young as sort of fifth and sixth grade is to, A, understand that they have an identity and a very specific role and that people are counting on them. So in games, there's this term called the free rider problem which we often see in collaborations about the person that can just like kind of draft on the back of everybody else. In cross-functional teams, there's no drafting because you, you hold the expertise and it's your responsibility, responsibility to contribute that to the group. Um, and that leads to incredible kinds of social skills um, that often haven't been taught in middle school. And we're seeing huge um, kind of growth in our students by leaps and bounds in these kind of socialization skills just based on that, those sort of work in, the, in those kinds of teams. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. this is this is for you as well, Katie. Okay. Um, given the collaborative nature and unique environment um, at your school, what changes have you seen in um, students' behavior and social emotional learning? Right. Well, it's interesting. Um, someone asked a similar question. I was in an event in DC yesterday, um, and they sort of framed it as, "What's the thing that has surprised you most?" And anecdotally, the thing that we have heard from parent after parent is that they have been amazed at the sort of social skills that their kids have developed in the school. So a lot of the parents said, well, you know, my fifth grader last year was really quiet. They like to spend a lot of time by themselves. They, they um, you know, socialized with their little clique of friends, but they didn't, they didn't do well in sort of mixing with, with a variety of groups. Um, and parents are saying, wow, our kids are just blossoming socially. They have this um, vocabulary that they come out talking with these giant words. They um, are mixing with all kinds of kids in the school. The kids have a kind of self-confidence about their abilities, even if they're not good at everything. One thing we try to help kids understand is that nobody's good at everything, and what you need to be good at is knowing what you're not good at, and finding who, who you can go talk to to, to find that resource. Um, and so that's the, one of the, the biggest surprises that we didn't expect was this kind of social piece. We also have a whole set of competencies in the schools around socio-emotional learning and civics. So things around regulating your behavior, notions of empathy, notions of point of view. And so those competencies are built into the curriculum. Um, and parts of the activities that kids are doing are designed to help kids get skills in those areas. And then they're assessed on those. So on their report cards home, they get you know, evaluation and how they're doing with empathy, for example, which is a big deal for middle school kids because they're not so good at that. I mean, as well as adults. We're not so good at that sometimes, too. So, that, so that's been a, a really beautiful thing, and we realized, wow, we, could, we need to do more research into this and understand more what it is about the model that might be leading to these kinds of outcomes. A couple more questions. Go ahead. Young Chicago authors, uh, Louder Than a Bomb is, is one of our programs, Woo! and so we also are very proud of uh, you media. Uh, and I understand your program works in the library, and I think that's wonderful, but that's a, kind of a voluntary association because those kids come to you. I was wondering what do you think of the prospects of these kinds of programs in the public schools, particularly the underperforming schools? Well, um, our work started in the public schools, and we're still working in public schools. We're in five, um, five Chicago middle schools every day, after, every day after school. So I think we need all spaces. Um, we need libraries are a hub, or an essential hub, and we need you medias and, and libraries. We need them in schools. We need them in all the community centers. So I think we need to figure out how to connect learning opportunities in all the spaces where kids spend their time because no one place can, can provide everything that a kid needs. We need to figure out how to connect these places and how to let kids take their experiences from one place to the other and know that they matter and, that, and know that adults understand those experiences that they've, that they've uh, learned in other places and how to build on them and connect, and connect to them. I'm managing time here a little bit. Because um, we're we started off by running over a little bit, and I, I do want to say that if folks are, it's completely. I know there are lots of questions, and we're going to stay to continue to answer questions. But I also want to say that if folks, if we want to take a minute, and if folks also want to go upstairs to uh, some of the demonstrations on the ninth floor, um, also because there are a lot of folks here, and we only have three elevators anyway. It would be fantastic if some folks want to go up and start checking out the demonstrations. That would be terrific. So why don't we take a second and let some folks go who would like to go up to the ninth floor um, and, and try out. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Judith. Hi. Uh, does the um, cost and availability of equipment pose any constraints to digital learning? And, and if so, what do you see? How would you address that? So we've, um, yes it does, but I think it can be overcome. Um, we've always had the mindset that when we started our work even on the south side, of Chicago, uh, south side of Chicago, that we can figure out how to make the technology affordable. And we're able to do that. But now the cost of technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. So four and five years ago you might have to pay 1300 for a laptop. Now you can use an iPad for three to four or 500, can do some of the same things. So there's always gonna be high-end technology but there's also then what used to be high end becomes much more affordable. So I think we can figure out how to make things accessible and doable on, um, on smartphones. And also a thing that has happened that I think is really advantageous is to move, move to cloud computing where so many of your applications are on the web in the cloud. So 
Google Docs or things like that, if you use um, these types of programs, there instead of you having to have everything on your computer, it's stored in the cloud is what they call it. So you can access it wherever you are, which means you don't have to have as technical of a machine. So we're getting to the point where ubiquity of access, everyone having access to some type of computational device, I think is going to be the norm. And we can build around it. And then, yeah. um, so I uh, work for Northwestern University up on the, the north end of uh, the Chicago area. And I work specifically with faculty and graduate student instructors um, in promoting teaching with technology and learning with technology. Um, so I guess I'm just curious to hear, um, I guess primarily from Shani at this point, um, given the fact that DYN and the Quest schools are preparing kids in such exceptional ways. I mean, my main concern is whether faculty at our higher education institutions are going to be ready <laughs> for these impressive, uh, these impressive kids. So uh, I mean, Shani, you alluded to this already in terms of your Spanish class and explaining your tech savviness and preferences to your instructor. But um, what other responses have you seen in terms of what your unique skill sets are? Um, and how have you worked with instructors to help them understand um, what your skills are and how you prefer to learn? Um, well, one thing that I've noticed is that with my digital media skills, it's kind of made me the teacher pet because they've always come to me and ask me how to, oh, Shani, I need this projector set up or something like that. So <laughs> um, there, there is a slight gap in between our, you know, technology literate, um, literacy, but um, it's also like giving them like an open mind to want to learn about it because a lot of times you find that people who have not grown up with digital media think that it's just a bunch of mess and you know they like these computers oh what did I don't care about this mess give me a piece of pen and paper you know and I'm like I'll type it on my phone you know and um, but they're they're much more willing to learn and yes there have definitely been some you know bridges we've had to cross with like how they for example. Um, uh, I like to use uh, on Word, they have track changes to edit a paper. I like to use that instead of, you know, just going through and marking up the paper with red pen all the time because it's, you can type more on track changes and you can see exactly what they're doing. But, you know, the regular teacher doesn't necessarily know how to use those type of functions on Word. But um, once they see what they can do, they're actually really, really open to it. And so I think uh, it, we're bridging the gap and it's actually bringing the students closer to the teachers because now um, it's not just student teacher where they all perform just one function where I'm the student and they're teaching me. Now I'm actually being able to teach them something and they're teaching me something in return. You know, and I don't I think it just kind of brings us together and gives us a level ground for us to, you know, get along on. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. The Pearson Foundation does a lot of training of teachers in this space, and one of the things we've learned by doing that is um, the easiest way to get teachers to understand this process is by treating them like the way the students are treated in these environments, um, and to focus much more on how, sort of the how and the what, rather than the what of, of whatever happens. So I would just recommend, we, and we, we do this a lot, we, we work together with the Smithsonian where we bring teachers. Is, you just have to think of some environment where they get to act like interested students. And um, that's very jarring, I think, at a certain age, but um, we, we found that it works. Mm -hmm. Phil, can I just, I just want to add one thing. So it's, um, I think it's a bit of a misno misnomer to think that we're in a day and age where you can learn everything. We, we know that we, that we can't. And in fact, the technology that we know now will look different even next year. Um, and so this, I, this idea that we're trying to cultivate in students to be flexible and adaptable and to be learners, to constantly be learning, is also a disposition we want to make sure teachers have, um, whether it's middle school, high school, or, or college teachers. Because the truth is, it's just we're not in a day and age anymore where you can just learn to run the slide projector or how to do this one thing, and it's going to be that way for 20 years. It's not. It's going to change from year to year. Um, and so that, I think, is just a mindset that we have to start to cultivate. And, and once you have that... Don, good. did you have a question?
Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there's been both sides that I've experienced. Um, kids who don't have a one-to-one -one laptop program at their schools, um, when they hear it, they're often pretty impressed, like, well, I want to go to that school, but it's probably just because of the 15000 or $1,500 laptop that's sitting in front of us that they want to go. But um, when they see what we're doing with it, sometimes they're, you know, interested and sometimes they're not as into it because it still, you know, requires a certain level of work and learning something new. But um, I've definitely seen them say, oh, man, I wish I could do this in my classroom and now I want to learn. And that's when you media comes in handy because I can say, oh, well, I'm, I don't know how you can get it in your school necessarily, but if you really, really want to get involved and you're passionate about it and you think that what I'm doing is nice, then you can definitely head over to UMedia and they'll welcome you with open arms. So I think that's where those type of facilities come in handy. Yeah, did you have a question? Okay. We, we several of us, oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, do you have any programs where you're learning to grow potatoes and things like that? Uh, the other end of Whole Foods. I mean, are there are there programs of sort where kids are uh, have opportunities to put things in the ground and so forth and see them grow? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that question. So part of, I think, what your question is getting at is when we talk about this work, sometimes people think we're only talking about digital all the time and that we're only talking about 21st century things. Um, and in fact, I think, Nicole, you're really clear in, the, in the, the piece about this is that this work is about bridging very traditional notions of literacy and also hands-on stuff, like growing things in a garden with some digital stuff. So the, the kids at the school right now um, are working on a sustainability unit and they are gr growing things in the lab and they're monitoring, using sens digital sensors to monitor oxygen levels and they're learning about kind of data. But it's this combination of the, the very kind of hands-on thing with the, with the more digital. And it's just the right tool for the, the right thing. So this work is not about living in a virtual world. It's actually about living in the real world and getting your hands dirty, but with just a range of tools. Um, we're really only, we're, um, I've been told that I should just do one more question. And then our panelists will be here for folks to come up and ask questions of. And um, I want to invite everybody up to the demonstrations. Before I do that and, and give you the last question, I also want to thank Malcolm for coming and joining us. Malcolm, if you could stand up for a sec. Hmm? He's at the hall. Malcolm, who, is also, um, who I met also when he was in sixth grade, is also now a student at DePaul. So thank you. Go ahead. Um, hi. I just, uh, it's kind of building off the previous questions a bit. And recently in Henry Jenkins' blog, he interviewed James Paul Gee, mm -hmm. and he, um, mentioned um, kind of compared teachers to surgeons and about the accountability during training and talks about a radical um, change in the school of education, um, which also interests me. And so I'd like to know what you would think about, um, um, for me, as I'm thinking of going back, but i thinking I want that radical change. So what would you see as someone going forward um, could expect or could ask for, this is what I want to have in my training? To be a teacher? I mean, is training to be a teacher? Right, as in, um, you know, going for a, a, a master's in education and designing it for, for these new paradigms of learning that you're all implementing. So, so what should that look like? So one is to think, um, I think I tried to touch on this a little bit earlier. We, in the past, have thought about teaching, teacher, classroom. And if we can think about teaching, learning, um, being a peer, being a student, as one big space and across multiple different spaces. So now with technology, you can be learning at the park. You can you know, have uh, RFID and pull up some information on a plant. So there's all kinds of different ways in which we can expand learning outside of the classroom. So think about if you have a program where you can, where in the program you are thinking about how do you design learning activities and learning experiences that cut across all these different spaces. And also, I think this is part of what uh, Mimi Ito's work talks about in interest-driven uh, learning, where you also are having people learn across multiple different ages. So it doesn't have to be a sixth grader learning with a sixth grader. If a sixth grader knows something that uh, a 12th grader or a 21 year old knows, there's ways in which you can build these relationships. So getting outside of the box of thinking about time, geography, and also age-based, age as constraints on learning would be important. And a, a good way to do that would be to go to the Umedia Center. Just go to the library and, 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 and get Mary maybe to get you in. 
and just <laughs> just hang out there for a while because you'll see all that happening. And if you ask that question of the kids there, you'd get the answer you're after. The other thing I would add to that is to um, that part of your education should be about design and thinking like a designer. So the biggest shift that we've seen in the teachers at our school is that they're actually given identities as designers that are responsible for the design of the experiences that their children are having. Um, and that's a fundamental shift, I think, for some teachers who have thought traditionally about themselves as sort of deliverers of information rather than really the, the orchestrators of this entire sets of experiences, as Nicole said, both in school, out of school. Um, and that's a very doable thing to think about design as a part of, a part of that curriculum. Thank you all so much.